and Fran Siegel. Um, and I serve as president of the US Impact Investing Alliance and executive director of the Tipping Point Fund on Impact Investing. And I am thrilled to be here today with three, I don't know if I'm dynamic, but they're definitely dynamic <laughs> practitioners. Um, and they do work on a day-to-day -day basis catalyzing capital off the sidelines. I think the announcement that we just heard from United uh, Health Group is a perfect example of capital off the sidelines. And it takes the vision of a C-suite like and a CEO, like we just heard from, to understand the power that is resides on these corporate balance sheets. We saw a lot of money flowing in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the constellation of crises um, at that time, a lot of money um, off of corporate treasury balance sheets moving to CDFIs and others. So there, there are the, this precedent of corporates understanding that there is impact hiding on their balance sheet. We know that foundations do a lot of mission-related investing. I'm sure we could all agree that um, they should do more. And I think what distinguishes our panel is uh, just the quality and the caliber of the innovation that is being done to layer capital, think about capital in a very innovative way as a way to draw more capital off balance sheets, uh, logical and illogical perhaps suspects to create impact. We know the SDGs are, you know, they're up in just like three, two, one, you know, handful of years. Uh, by most estimates, we need trillions of dollars a year in order to meet them. And um, we think humbly that this is one way that we can catalyze more investment capital. So I am thrilled to be joined today by Elaine Martin, who serves as Senior Vice President of Fidelity Charitable's private donor group. Uh, Fidelity Charitable, she'll talk about it in a little bit, but is the largest donor advised fund in the country and is probably the largest grant maker in the country bar no, bar Soros, bar Gates. So it's, it's, it's en enormous. We have Jim Sorensen, who is president of the Sorensen Impact Foundation, among many other things. Um, and uh, as you can see, his name is in the Sorensen Impact Institute. This is the man. <laughs> this is the Sorensen that you've been hearing about. And um, we're so fortunate to have you on our board and our executive committee. And Tracy Palangin is CEO and co-founder and friend of me and many others <laughs> and the vice chair of the Alliance at Social Finance. So these are just like bleeding edge innovators and I just feel so fortunate to be alongside them. Um, we heard a lot about catalytic capital earlier in the day and I don't think I need to run through necessarily all the ways that capital, ca capital can be catalytic. A lot of times when folks hear of catalytic capital, they immediately think that it's concessionary in returns. And sometimes that, sometimes that is true, but other times perhaps it's patient. Other times there's like a problem with risk perception, and so an unfunded guarantee might do the trick. Um, there are many ways to be catalytic, some of which are concessionary and others of which are not. Maybe investing in a first-time fund manager of color who might have a lot of difficulty getting to that first, it's not easy for anyone to get to a first close on a first fund. Um, but there are many, many ways to be catalytic and we'll hear the range of them um, today. If anyone wants to learn more about that, their Tideline has, the consulting firm Tideline, has a very interesting and I think pretty exhaustive um, set of examples and a framework for catalytic capital. So, with no, <laughs> I've been talking too much as a moderator. Um, I want to hear from the panelists. And so I'm wondering if I can ask each of you to speak about um, your institution, um, how you come to Catalytic Capital. So maybe I can start with Tracy. Sure. Well, it's great to be here. Mm -hmm. And to echo um, Fran's point, thank you, Jim, for yes stewarding this community, bolstering us, and um, we were just talking about this in the green room, there are probably hundreds of people sitting in this room, but somehow you've turned this into a family affair, and it's mm. like a family reunion So for so many of us in the field, and so really appreciate your leadership in this space and, and taking on SOCAP Global. Um, so um, I co-founded Social Finance 13 years ago, and you probably 
know us as the social impact bond shop. This, for some odd reason, despite many years of not really doing that many SIBs, the mm -hmm. acronym, um, we still have that reputation. But to take a step back, Social Finance was founded in the very early days of impact investing. I think the Rockefeller Foundation had just coined the term. And we were very intent on bringing a catalytic capital, wasn't the moniker at the time, but to occupy the space of impact first investing 13 years ago, and to do so in a way that is not just activating private capital, but really nudging uh, systems change um, at the policy level, at the governmental level. Um, and for those who are familiar with the social impact bond, that was very much the intention behind that first tool that we brought to the market. Um, we never thought as um, impact first capital or catalytic capital as uh, the kind of capital that you deploy, but rather a reflection of the kind of approach, the sensibility, um, a set of intentions that you approach impact investing. So the first question we always ask is, what kind of impact do you want to achieve? And therefore, what kind of risk are you willing to pursue in order to achieve that impact? And then with that kind of impact uh, intention and, and the risk tolerance, what is the right kind of capital to uh, deliver on that? And then you can think about structuring capital and our um, sector is so good at lots of technical language, but that's usually kind of comes at the bottom. And the social impact bond is exactly what that is. You start with the exact problem you want to achieve. How are you going to define it? How do you know that you've achieved the impact? And, and then everything else follows. So while the SIP experiment um, has not been a rocket ship, um, and, um, and, and, and uh, the jury is still out, one would say, uh, our team um, has pivoted toward using the same kind of quote unquote pay for success principles to apply it in a different arena. And that uh, is over the upscaling arena, job training arena over the last five years. Um, so we have created another tool called the Career Impact Bond. Um, and we have deployed it um, in the last three or four years, uh, a little over $200 million in various structures, um, a structure with Google Alphabet, which was $100 million to upskill 20,000 people who are low skilled, who typically don't have four year degrees to get the skills to enter the digital economy and, and to achieve a billion dollars in wage gains. We also express this in, and, and Jim, you're gonna talk about um, all the amazing bills. Uh, we're also thinking about a bunch of sectoral uh, strategies. How do you prepare the next generation of climate workers, of the healthcare workforce? Um, so whether it's the, you know, kind of SIB or the KIB and lots of other acronyms, um, uh, but th that is kind of the, the energy and the DNA that we bring to this work. Thank you, Tracy. And we're going to dig in on some uh, case studies in a moment, but it's just great to hear at a very high level the incredibly innovative work that you've done. So Jim, would love to go to you now. Sorensen Impact Foundation does a lot of work around program-related investments uh, through the lens of catalytic capital. And I'm wondering if you can just introduce uh, Sorensen Impact Foundation and uh, how you think about these tools. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Fran. It's a real honor and pleasure to be uh, on such a distinguished panel and in front of such a, a great group here at SOCAP. We really appreciate everybody coming. Uh, a little bit about me. My background is that of a, a serial entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, very early on, I realized the, um, um, you know, the challenges of a new venture and risk and you know, often what it took to get something off the ground. It, it maybe took, um, you know, either patient or angel funding. It could be friends and family. Certainly, uh, it was not what you'd call risk-adjusted market rate, you know, investing. But I found success in that. Um, and as part of that success, learned that you could address a social problem, that you could benefit society, in a much more scalable, self-sustaining way uh, through a, a for-profit uh, entity. Um, and that's how I wanted to express my philanthropy. And I looked around and, and frankly, uh, the philanthropic world to me was great, but it didn't seem to be often scalable and self-sustaining like the business venture that I had. 
Um, and so, you know, I felt like my philosophy for philanthropy was, um, you know, I wanted something where the impact was much greater than the donation. Um, and, and I found that very early on that this often was in potentially disruptive, innovative, very high risk ideas um, and, and opportunities out there where you know the market rate capital was not um, present. And so it, it took really taking risk. Um, and at that point in time, I don't know that I thought of it necessarily as catalytic, but as I formed the foundation, I found this very interesting unused tool in the foundation world called program-related investments. A program-related investment is an investment that a foundation can make in a for-profit or it could be a non-profit entity. And uh, so long as the purpose of the, the, uh, the investment was not to make money, you could make that investment and have it considered part of the 5% requirement uh, that you had for grant making. And to me, the key there was being able to find, again, an innovative, potentially self-sustaining and scalable model for, for impact. And to me, that's how you were gonna really move the needle. If you really wanted to move the needle in this intractable world of so many problems that we face, you've gotta figure out a better way and you've gotta make it so that it's scalable and self-sustaining. That was the, the beginning. We now make many program-related investments. In fact, SOCAP you know, would be considered a program-related investment. And, and I have many, <laughs> many ventures around here that, um, that I've invested in that now are you know, really market rate, but they started small. They needed that, that catalytic capital. For an entrepreneur, it's often referred to as that gap where it, they're in the valley of death. They're looking for the next dollar to get them to the stage where they can prove out a model or, or become investable. We call it the pioneering gap. We look at it a little more, <laughs> more positively, but there are so many organizations out there that need this type of capital. And that's what you know, we sought to do. And then we learned that there's really innovative ways to blend this capital with other forms of assistance to leverage in market rate capital. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And that's where the real innovation and magic to catalytic capital, I think, really comes into play. But I've talked too much. I'm no, no, it's, thank you Thanks. so much. Um, Elaine, can you talk a little bit about how you come to this work as, mm -hmm. as a leader at Fidelity Charitable? And just to level set for the group, can you just explain what a donor advised yeah. fund or a DAF is? I realize many of you probably know it, but just yeah, in case. Thanks. And thank you all for um, inviting me to be part of this conversation, because I think it's what you're sharing is exactly where we've built on um, as, as part of our, our strategy at Fidelity Charitable. So as Fran mentioned, we are now the largest grant maker and the largest donor advised fund. Um, last year alone, we gave away um, 11, over $11 billion in grants. And, um, and what, we are, what we really frame our work around is this model of give, grow, and grant. We have over 300,000 donors um, in our donor community, so who have individual DAFs with us. And each of those donor advised funds has the opportunity to contribute assets, whether they're complex assets, appreciated securities, or cash into their donor advised fund, receive a, um, a, a tax benefit at that time, and then choose an investment strategy to be able to grow those assets for charitable purpose. And, um, and then we help with the due diligence to what we call, to support the grant making, um, which annually we hope will grow year over year increasingly. And within the, um, the donor advised fund model, I think we can see each of those 300,000 people as also having an opportunity to be impact investors. That's sort of the mindset they're already in because they're thinking about an investable or investment that they're making into the donor advised fund. And rather than thinking of themselves only as philanthropists or only as donors, they also see themselves as investors. And so I, we have a lot of 
different entry points where people can actually participate as an, an impact investor, um, whether it's through investments in pools. So every one of our donors has the ability to choose one of our 24 pools, five of which are dedicated impact pools, um, or there are other um, entry points, which we'll talk more about. Mm -hmm. Great. I realize um, I need to find myself someone who looks at me like I look at my three panelists. <laughs> 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 I just like, I just, <laughs> I just love what these three do, and it just makes me warm and fuzzy, and so I'm looking at them in a loving way, and I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? Um, okay. What's that? We need to look at you in a different way. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'd love to, to dig in on like a case study, and um, We've talked a little bit in preparation about what you would lift up, but up to you what you ultimately decide. Um, but Jim, maybe I can start with you and you can share an example of a catalytic investment, a program-related investment that you've made through the foundation where you think that uh, the approach to catalytic capital was particularly catalytic. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, um... Boy, there's so many examples, it's hard to uh, pick one. But um, the one that I can think of where um, we were able to bring in different players, and I, I think of the, the different pots of capital out there as part of the toolbox, so to speak, for impact investing. So, you know, you have grants that really are important. There are some things that only grants can help out with. Uh, then you have quite often, you know, concessionary capital that uh, will take uh, a haircut on the return. Uh, and then you, you have problems that are big enough that you need market rate. You need to engage, uh, you know, the traditional capital markets. Um, you know, one of the funds that we have stood up in the Sorensen Impact Group is a fund known as Catalyst. It's, um, it's a impact real estate fund. Um, and we take a very deliberate uh, process in assessing what the needs are in, in the communities, a very data-driven approach, um, whether it be affordability, whether it be economic development, whether it be access to services. We kind of like the social determinants of health in terms of the different factors that, that we look at. Um, and then, um, we score the, the pod projects that we potentially invest in according to how well they meet the needs of the, um, the assessment that we did. And then we use that essentially framework for measuring over time the impact and the actual performance of the investment. And one of the things that we look at is, is really um, the community involvement. Um, 25% of the value of the investments that we make in, um, in Catalyst are essentially concessionary. And they consist quite often from governments, from philanthropy, from, um, it could be those that would be willing to take a, a, a lower rate of return and market rate investors. And, and one such uh, uh, project is in Minneapolis. It's in a Somali neighborhood. Um, it's uh, uh, a neighborhood that has really this combination of meeting the needs of this community. So there is um, health care. There is uh, low-income elderly housing. Uh, and there is uh, low-income housing. Um, it has, as you know, all in this project. And as you look at the different sources uh, of value that came to play to make this work in order to, to leverage in market rate capital, we had tax increment funding from um, the uh, local entity. Um, for those of you that know what that is, that's where uh, the government entity will give up future tax flows to be, you know, put into the project. Uh, we had a couple of grants, um, and then we had um, 
uh, some CRA, uh, lower rate, and then market rate. And when you're able to bring all of that together, we were able to do something that was really meaningful that otherwise would not have been possible uh, in that situation. And that really is the power to, I think, financial innovation and bringing in uh, different groups that have their own objectives. One may be philanthropic, another may be uh, willing to take a concession in order to meet um, affordability goals or, or, or requirements for like a CRA uh, bank would, would need to do it. And then others would be market rate investors that like impact, but they need to get a market rate return. Mm -hmm. And to, to be able to bring them together in that way, I think you can really move the needle on a lot of these projects that otherwise might not be possible. Mm -hmm. And Jim is talking about blended finance. I'm not sure that you use the term. And for those of us that have done blended finance deals, you know that's really the agony and the ecstasy of blended <laughs> finance. Uh, we all see the potential to, to do the kinds of complex transactions that the Catalyst Fund does. Some of us have the skill set to draw on those various capital sources, including but not limited to government, which can be very difficult to navigate. Um, <clears throat> the transaction costs, structuring, I see Laurie Spangler here. She, she does that work in emerging markets. Um, <clears throat> it could be really difficult. And so um, it's great to hear about um, a fund that is doing this work, that's being successful. And on the other hand, we see the need, excuse me, we see the need to simplify some of these structures, uh, demystify some of the tranches that come in so that we can do more of this work. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, that was Andy McMahon, by the way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Elaine, I'd love to go to you and then to Tracy to talk about um, recoverable grants. And I think it's worth talking about <laughs> what those are in a DAF milieu and what you see as the potential for them. Yeah, absolutely. So for us, we've been experimenting in this, um, in the impact space in the donor advised fund for about 10 years now. And we started out really slowly. <laughs> and, um, and where we, we have, pr however, we're now at two and a half billion dollars in assets under management that are impact focused on the private side with debt instruments or in private equity or in, in venture funds. And what we are seeing is this increase, what we continuously saw was that donors were coming to us and saying, I have a, a deep commitment to a nonprofit organization. I want to give them an impact investment alongside the traditional grant I'm giving them. And so that's when we started to um, try some of these recoverable grants and look at them as bridge funds or as, um, as uh, time-bound um, initiatives. And so for the most part, we now can offer a recoverable grant at as low as $25,000 entry point, and, um, and in some cases as high as you know, $10 million um, as a recoverable grant that we have uh, made to an organization. And we have done um, about half a, million, half a billion dollars in recoverable grants so far um, in, in the last five-ish years to either as, um, as a model where you can make the grant and it gets returned to you. So I, I can think of a, you know, one that I did myself, which was to Partners in Health. Um, it was as part of their um, strategy to support a tuberculosis program in Peru. We were able to co uh, collectively fund together as a group of 30 donors um, this initiative. And um, within four years, it was paid back into our donor advised funds. So um, that, that model is actually being replicated in so many areas, not just health and not just um, real estate, but one of the ones that we commonly um, are getting engagement around and have been since 2019 is things like the Boston Impact Initiative, which is to support entrepreneurs, black and brown entrepreneurs, um, and they are building for-profit businesses funding them um, and being able to support them. We saw donors giving grants in 2019, recoverable grants that now are giving at the 100,000 or $250,000 level to support 
that as a cyclical fund. And so these are, um, this is a really exciting initiative for us to be experimenting with, and we've had a, a really wonderful partnership with Tracy and the team at Social Finance, where we've seen this model work um, really well with um, their Dreamers Fund and their Up Fund. So I don't know if you're gonna talk about that, but um, those were two areas where we've been able to push beyond the traditional to see donors give collectively and do that collective learning while also being able to, um, to utilize their, their DAF in a different way. I love the Boston Impact example uh, because it is really uh, a, a participatory investing entity and it experiments with uh, power sharing and power shifting to community members um, and if you're a member and it's a very low investment minimum, you get an equal vote to someone who comes in at a, at a higher minimum amount. Um, and so it, it, it just strikes a chord, an impact chord on so many levels. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you lifted that one up. And it was actually founded by a, a, a business school uh, colleague, Debbie Fries. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, great. Yes. So Tracy, would love to, if you would like to talk about your Impact First Fund of Funds, which is very innovative and in some ways was kind of created for family offices and for donor advised funds. Yeah, so whether it's in the PRI context in a private foundation mm -hmm. or a recoverable context in donor advised fund, what we've heard over the last decade from the people who have participated in our deals and fund is that we want to do more of this catalytic investing. We want to do more of this impact first investing. And we want to become Jim Sorensen. By the way, if anyone <laughs> wants to go to Salt Lake City, you should visit Jim's office because there's a whole wall of plaques of all his PRIs on one side, all his MRIs on the other wall. Um, and But people typically um, don't know how to think about taking the first step there are significant barriers to entry. You should look at the team at the Sorensen Impact Foundation. Um, they have tremendous expertise. They source well, they can diligence, both on the impact side and the financing side. They also have the apparatus to continue to manage for that impact over time so that you can actually um, be accountable to the impact that, that you seek. Um, and so after talking to a lot of individuals, families who are um, philanthropic, who are impact investing curious, who are wealthy, they um, asked us if we would create a one-stop shop to make impact first investing much more accessible, much easier, and much more cost efficient. So uh, a couple of months ago, we launched the Social, impact, uh, Social Finance Impact First Fund, which is structured as an open-ended fund of funds or multi-manager platform, however uh, you wanna describe it. <laughs> but the idea is to create a one-stop shop um, product so that one of Elaine's 300,000 um, donor advised fund holders can just do a recoverable grant and then access a diversified basket of amazing catalytic managers um, across asset classes in impact credit and impact real estate and impact cash in even venture and, and growth equity across different uh, thematic areas. And the idea is to make it very easy for them. The minimum that we've chosen to do is just $100,000. And we've created the plumbing now, not only at Fidelity Charitable, but also at the other nationals like Vanguard, community foundations like the Boston Foundation, um, the faith-based ones like um, certain Jewish Federation donor advised fund. Uh, we're also seeing the same thing with private family foundations. Uh, they, they're impact curious, but they, don't have the teams to do a recoverable grant, to do a PRI. A again, it's uh, that easy um, uh, entry point. But the, the, the broader um, aim is, is not to just you know, create this product and yes, it would be great to have people experience. The broader theory of change is to accelerate the supply and demand of capital in this catalytic space so that if you have more of capital available, there'll be more of these, the, the amazing disability fund that we just heard about. There'll be more you know, Boston Impact Capital. And we'll just uh, enable entrepreneurs to come up with new models to address these massive challenges ahead of us, new business models. And you know, yes, it's ideas that are too new, too risky, maybe profit constrained. Um, and so the idea is, is to have this vehicle be able to 
um, get lots of these ideas going. Um, the first investment that we just made uh, is one that, if, if I have a quick minute, Fran, I, I just want to share. I just love the team that John Green at the Black Star Stability Distressed Debt Fund has created. It's such a beautiful impact thesis. Um, they just raised a $100 million fund. We took a, the fund of funds took a $5 million position, and they're trying to tackle this really ugly, predatory seller finance uh, type of tool called contracts for deed in, in, in the United States. It is a $200 billion market. This is a legacy of redlining. I see Lori nodding. Um, basically, traditional banks would not lend into certain zip codes, yet people need capital to finance their $50,000 trailer home. And so this is um, a, a CFDs, contract for deeds, is a very predatory form of seller financing where you have all the burdens of home ownership and none of the benefits. You have to keep up with your house, you have to pay all your monthly payments, you gotta pay your tax, but you never hold title until your last payment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the team at Blackstar is gonna buy up these CFDs um, at a discount, work with the um, homeowners to season um, their uh, CFDs into conforming traditional home mortgages and then flip them in the secondary market and that's how they create a net IR for investors. So you can imagine just the impact, like how can it not be catalytic, right? You immediately lower the monthly payments, you immediately take partial equity into your home and that's a form of wealth building that we're just so excited about. Super exciting. Um, so um, would love to shift a little bit to how do we scale this market? And Jim, um, you're very active in public policy. We've had three landmark bills passed, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, that particularly the Inflation Reduction Act will be flowing a lot of capital, but together it will be hundreds of billions of dollars leveraged with private capital. It will be trillions of dollars. And so can you talk a little bit, you, you talked about the Community Reinvestment Act, you talked about like state tax credits. Can you speak a little bit about what you think the opportunity here is and what the role of, the role that impact investors can play to make sure that that capital flows with impact integrity? Yeah, I think um, whenever you can get the government on board, um, and it's amazing, you know, how bipartisan these uh, legislative initiatives are. Um, I think it's really a great thing for, for impact investing and for opportunities that I think can ultimately make really big changes, system changes. Um, you know, you mentioned a little bit about the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. As, as part of that is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, and that is, a, I think, a pretty exciting opportunity, potentially a catalytic opportunity for impact investors. Uh, when you kind of boil it down, I think there are three main um, sections of that. There's the National Clean Investment Fund, which consists of about $14 billion and is really targeted to um, be invested alongside uh, private investors to catalyze, um, you know, private investment into uh, investments that would, uh, uh, you know, achieve, uh, you know, clean energy goals that, that are out there. So a lot of opportunities for impact in that space for uh, where the government will come alongside and, and match. Um, there's the Clean Communities Investment Accelerator, which... Um, is another part of that, and it's about $6 billion. This is really oriented more on the, uh, the debt side and providing, um, you know, thousands of community-led uh, investment projects, primarily in LMI, low to moderate income communities. Uh, again, I think a very catalytic uh, part of that uh, legislation. And then the final is solar for all, um, which is about $7 billion that will go to uh, the 60 states and, um, uh, you know, eligible municipal governments and, and entities uh, to, again, really focus on LMI communities, but, you know, enabling 
clean energy and, and solar for, for that population. So I think a really great opportunity. I think we're, we're, we also um, have talked a little bit about, not um, in that legislation, but legislation right now that's uh, kind of tracking called the uh, Employee and Equity Investment Act, um, which really provides, I think, a really nice incentive for investors to invest in funds that uh, will help enable employee buyouts, ESOPs, uh, so that uh, employees that don't have an opportunity for building equity in, that comes with, with owning a company have that opportunity. And there are literally tens of millions of people and really uh, millions of aging baby boomers that will be selling companies that could become really, um, you know, targets for this type of legislation if, if it passes. Uh, so I think there's, there's really some exciting ways mm -hmm. for the federal government to really become involved in incentives that are low cost, that ultimately more than pay for themselves in uh, the benefits that uh, will accrue to either the climate or to people. Mm -hmm. And I would just add on to that, that uh, President Biden uh, issued an executive order um, putting into place something called the Justice 40. So infrastructure and uh, environmental funding that comes from the government, at least 40% of it needs to be deployed to underserved communities, historically underserved communities. And we think that it's, that in fact investors have a very important role to play in uh, uh, keeping the government and private sector capital that might not be impact oriented honest and lifting up community priorities so that it's not just government and private money coming in and determining uh, the, the infrastructure and the sustainable investment uh, priorities of communities that we have to lift up community voices. So Elaine and Tracy, I would love for you to share with us some ideas for how we can convert folks from impact curious to impact enthusiasts. <laughs> how, do we get the, how do we get that money off the sidelines? I, you know I worked as chief investment officer at Impact Assets, which is an impact investing donor advised fund. We were purely dedicated and we drew clients that wanted to invest, but at a big, Na the biggest national DAF, how do you go about that evangelical process to kind of move people <laughs> along to being willing to deploy capital for impact? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a few things that come to mind. One is when we started doing this work, 90% of the people who were coming to us saying they wanted to do impact investment were women. Hmm. So we we saw this as an opportunity to say, here's here's how we... Um, capitalize on this community who are already leaders in their grant making strategies and their families and have them drive the vision for what this looks like. And we partnered with Invest for Better to help create a toolkit and start to give some language. So I think part of it is it's so over, it's very overwhelming and intimidating to enter this space if you have not been part of it. And if you're, if you're in a traditional grant making structure and that the reason you come to the donor advice fund is because you want it to be simple and effective and accessible and not have a lot of steps on the way. How do you actually do that? So partnering with funds of funds, I think, is a really key strategy. And also thinking about how do you engage your investment advisor to be able to have a different kind of conversation around what you're really looking at is another key strategy for us. Um, and I think the other big thing is we're in the business of democratizing philanthropy. We want to see more grants go out the door with an impact focus um, and catalyze that, that grant making in a different way. So today we want to put a challenge out um, to our donors and, and to other donor advice funds to say we want to double the impact investing grants to nonprofits and recoverable grants um, in the next five years to a billion dollars. And we want to see that happen. So that's, that's the first thing. And we want to challenge our partners who are out there to do the same, because I do think this is a really simple tool that already makes sense for the donor. They understand the methodology. They understand the mechanism. And it's, it's um, supporting a strategy that already exists. So this is a really exciting um, shift for us to be able to commit to that and then be able to build on that um, 
for the future? Okay, first, wow. It's amazing. This is really exciting. <laughs> and I think I said to you, if you can mobilize that capital, the Charit Fidelity Charitable will be the biggest funder of impact investing infrastructure in the country by probably, I don't know, you know, an order of magnitude. <laughs> like, you'll be a... We love a challenge. You will never be able to get out of this room, <laughs> like... Yeah, exactly. You'll become, like, your dance card will be filled at all times. I time. do think our donors are ready. They have been building up to this, and I think the sector is ready and desperately in need of it. This is not just... We can't rely on grants alone. They're, the whole purpose of the Donor Advised Fund is to give that funding away. So if mm. we don't activate it in all the ways we can, we're not doing justice to this. I'd love to hear that from a deaf administrator. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love it. Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Should Elaine, I hope this is going to inspire your peers. I hope follow so too, so please. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because what is the purpose of that capital? They've taken their tax deduction and it needs to be put to work either in the grant making or through impact investing. So th this is amazing. And it's fun. And it's fun. <laughs> but importantly, what you said earlier, Elaine, is, is spot on. It's fun, but it cannot be complicated. And sometimes we like to have alphabet soup and Talk in technical me? language. No, I'm not looking <laughs> at you. You know you. Um, but um, we need to simplify how we talk about this, um, both in, in in the marketing and the narrative of it. And and so what we've been trying to say at Social Finance of late is, when you think about your traditional investing portfolio, everyone talks of a compounding return. That's finance 101. That's how you think about um, having. A, great uh, investment returns over time. Think of your impact first allocation or your impact investing allocation as compounding impact. Mm -hmm. Imagine just money uh, going out, investing behind these amazing new entrepreneurs coming up with amazing new business models to solve problems. The money comes back, you do more and more of it. Imagine having a steady allocation for problems and solutions that that kind of capital is suitable for. And of course, you continue to do pure grant making because certain problems are always going to require that kind of capital to address. Um, that is resonating with um, folks, the idea of compounding impact, and we're conti continuing to test the language. So that's just on the narrative side. But then it's also about, uh, from an execution perspective, not only making it easy for donors to say, hey, I want to make a recoverable grant into this, or you know, the fund of funds, or Jim's disability fund, or whatever, but also making it easy and turnkey for the sponsors. That's a big one. We've talked to many, many of the sponsors in the space, and uh, different back offices have different um, operational capacity, different legal interpretation, different risk tolerance. And we're basically saying, we can structure a recoverable grant for you, if you like a recoverable grant, or we can structure as an investment for you, like what impact assets would do. Um, the, the legal uh, toolkit has gotten much more flexible to enable sponsors with various um, degrees of capacities and appetites to, to execute this on behalf of their clients. So we're really, really excited about activating that group. Mm. Yeah. The goal is to grow the tent. Fran, speaking of growing the tent, I think what we're talking about is really wonderful, and it deals mainly with the 5%. What about the other 95%? I think there's a tremendous opportunity for really the, the mission-related investments that potentially could be made by foundations and endowments that uh, would unlock you know, really much greater pools of capital. Um, you know, our foundation made that decision. Um, it was, for us at the time, uh, somewhat of a, a, a leap of faith. You know, this was in 2017. We were going to go 100% in. Uh, it took us about three years to do that. Uh, and we've been able to do it across asset classes. So um, in, a, in a balanced portfolio, we have fixed income, large cap, small cap, emerging markets, so forth, uh, and have been able to generate market rate returns, in fact, beat the market 100% impact. And it would be great to see uh, you know, that happen to the, the other side of, of the portfolios out there as well. Definitely. Agreed. Um, 
100% of the foundation assets are in the public trust, and 5% is sprinkled around. But mm -hmm. uh, we all see that mission-related investing, endowment investing for impact, other aligned strategies like proxy voting and shareholder engagement can also um, increase uh, the impact. The Alliance actually recently published um, a piece of research that was funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called Impact in the Balance, and we called for more program-related investments and more mission-related investments, but also tried to look at the liability side of the balance sheet and say that there's impact hiding there in the form of unfunded guarantees. Uh, a number of foundations issued ESG bonds to the public markets at, around the time of COVID to um, accelerate the grant payout to try to throw a lifeline to a bunch of nonprofit organizations that were looking at going under. And so playing with like what I call the time value of impact in the same way that we play with the time value of money. Um, so yeah, foundations, we need to, they need to do more for sure. Um, so Jim, let me go back to you just for a quick second. You mentioned um, in the past that you've had some investments that came in as program-related investments and then graduated to mission-related investments. So can you talk about that? Like, what are the circumstances under which, uh, I won't say graduation, because that implies uh, a, a value, but like, what, what are the um, market failures that you're solving for in PRIs that then allow some but not all to graduate to MRIs? Well, I think when you look at <clears throat> the marketplace, you know, and, and most of the PRIs would be considered early stage venture. Um, you know, in the venture world, you're going to have some that uh, are going to maybe get a 1x return. You know, they're, they're not going to be great returns. Uh, you're going to have some failures along the way. Uh, and then you're going to have some that just are home runs. You know, maybe they're, they're you know, 10x and sometimes even more. Uh, so it is a little bit uh, dependent on really the, uh, you know, the, the quality of the management team, and the opportunity and timing in the marketplace. It's that way for impact, just like it is in the traditional markets. Uh, we, we've been, I think, really successful with our program-related investments. We've made probably 70, 80 of them in the last uh, 10 years. And I would say of those, maybe, uh, you know, 10 to 20 percent are in funds. So a first-time fund manager. Um, and we've, we have, a, I think, an amazing success story in that, you know, we only have maybe about four or five of those that have been failures. And um, the rest continue to operate. If, if we were to aggregate their numbers, they're about 10x the size that they were when we be began. So the, the impact has really grown. Um, and, you know, they're reaching about 600 million people. So um, it's, and across all of the sustainable development goals. And then we have, I would say, about a half a dozen of those, maybe maybe more, that have graduated, so to speak, in that, you know, they're now attracting market rate capital uh, and to the point where they're looking pretty good to us for a market rate investment for the endowment, which, you know, it has a bogey, when I say bogey, a return, we need to we need to make about a seven, eight percent return there just to keep up with uh, inflation. Uh, so these need to be really good investments. Um, and when we talk about the logo walls that we have, it's always great to see some that were on the PRI wall that are now on the MRI wall, the mission-related investment wall. Um, and we, we do see that. Um, and it's a validation to us that this really is a spectrum. It is a developing, growing marketplace, just like venture was before it, when it started in the early 70s. You know, that's what's happening in the impact investing space right now. And as we continue, we're going to see more products. We're going to see more successful fund managers. 
We're going to see more uh, investment, direct investment opportunities, and we're going to see impact investing really um, mainstream, not only for right now family offices, high net worth individuals, but also for endowments and institutional investors. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when, obviously, you get even much greater scale. So that track record, track record would be the envy of any Silicon yes. Valley VC, so kudos to you and your team. <laughs> um, Tracy, we know that there are certain investment theses, there are certain geographies, there are certain um, investment types that may never graduate. They require permanent subsidy, and I feel like you, have, you wrote the book a little bit on that, on innovative structures to address intractable challenges. So could you talk just for a minute about like the, the, the Dreamer uh, initiative or the, the Worker Upskilling Fund? Absolutely. The beautiful thing is many of the managers we anticipate going into the Fund of Funds vehicle will graduate like Black Star because if they can prove out... Yours was a, was a successful PRI for us. Oh, yes. <laughs> ex ex exactly. You mean the... Um, Massachusetts. The Massachusetts one. That actually was a very successful PRI. Yeah. It, it, it's, at the end of the day, it's, um, it, it really depends on the problem that you're trying to address, right? Um, Fran mentioned two specific vehicles, which is in our um, economic mobility portfolio at Social Finance. And uh, we believe, because of our commitment to student friendliness... Um, these uh, types of deals will probably require a permanent subsidy because we're really going after a very vulnerable population. We have a strong commitment to ensuring that this type of consumer finance remains the most student-friendly. Um, so, for example, the Dreamers Graduate Loan Fund that we built, uh, we're, we are providing the um, same rate of financing that U.S. citizens could get from the federal government when they go get their medical degree, get their JD, et cetera. But because DREAMers, uh, people with DACA status or TPS, temporary protective status, they are allowed to uh, live in our country. They're allowed to go to public schools. They're even authorized to work. But because they're not U.S. citizens, they don't get Pell Grants. They don't get the federal student subsidized loan program. So we created a vehicle to enable them to borrow at approximately the same rate as U.S. citizens. Now, people, if you really underwrite that, like how do we even price the risk of DACA getting repealed? I mean, you can't even do that, mm -hmm. right? And it, you know, if, if it gets repealed, they can't work in this country and the whole thing is like poof, right? So it will require catalytic capital to get that program going and, and we foresee that. We're doing a lot in the upscaling arena. Jim talked about the IRA. Just between the BIL and the IRA, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, Brookings estimates that there will be 32 million new workers needed. Half because the workforce is aging out, and the other half we need new infrastructure and climate workers with the new skills that will be required from solar, um, wind turbines, renewables of all kinds. Um, we are working on a really exciting strategy because we are not going to achieve the green transition we all want unless we have the workforce to deliver on it. So how are we going to, like a snap of a finger, come up with 30 million skilled workers, right? This is going to be a long road. And we're thinking about various uh, workforce financing tools. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, if the consumer is the one, the worker is the one going to repay, even if it's incredibly student friendly. Um, and many of our deals are no fees, um, no, no interest rate, and it's just literally repaying the cost of the loan if they're able to get up that economic escalator. It's inherently subsidized, and it will be subsidized forever. Mm. So I'm going to ask one kind of philosophical question <laughs> that we have talked about, but it's one that I'm a little obsessed with. And that is in a world and a financial, the financial capital markets that do not price in externalities that are rife with systemic risks like climate change and inequality. What is market rate? What is a market rate investment? And do catalytic, like on an impact adjusted basis, are catalytic capital investments like the ones that Tracy mentioned, are they really concessionary? That is doing the job of like a, a social failure, a social market failure. And so in a, in like a, we operate within a profoundly broken economic system and financial system. And um, 
we always compare catalytic capital to market rate, but what is embedded in market rate is a ton of negative externalities, social, economic, and environmental externalities, some positive as well, um, but it's, I, I believe that corporations since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution have been, have free, have been free riders on the back of communities, workers, the environment, families. And I think the work that you all are doing are really about like, can we move from risk adjusted to impact adjusted? And we might say that some of the initiatives that you talked about in, on an impact adjusted basis are actually more competitive than so-called market rate. So just wondering if we can kind of get a little philosophical before we take some. Oh. <laughs> I didn't answer the question. <laughs> I just posed the question, so. Well, I will say this. I've been an entrepreneur for all my life, investing in many companies. Um, and as I look at all of the great successes that I've had at the time that I made the investment, or and it was not just an investment of time, but it was an investment of myself, my energies, you know, my time, um, I wouldn't consider any of them market rate. And yet, they were fantastic successes. So, you know, I think we get hung up sometimes on this market rate, um, you know, and I think you can get really, uh, sophisticated and, and look at, um, you know, what uh, your investment advisor is going to say is market rate, but it, it, you're going to have a hard time really ever meeting, moving the needle if you're constantly focused on, is this market rate? Mm -hmm. uh, because at some point in time, you know, you have to take the leap of faith to really make something work. Uh, you know, I, and I, in my experience, uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Now, I'm, I'm not, you know, a, a, someone that is financially managing money for other people, but I've, I've found that, um, you know, when you bet on yourself and, and on principles and values and on good people around you, um, those are the important things to create value. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Any other comments on my unanswerable question? <laughs> like, what if we waved a magic wand and we had impact-adjusted benchmarks? We've all sat in these meetings with wealth advisors saying, oh, we outperformed the benchmark by 200 basis points. Um, but if it were impact-indexed, who knows? Maybe it would be... Would, it wouldn't, or, or if the benchmark was impact index, maybe they are underperforming the market. Well, um, people probably know about the effort that George Seraphim has been working on at Harvard Business School called Impact Weighted Accounts, and it's now been spun off as a C3 called, is not a good acronym, International I Foundation for Valuing Impacts. There you go. I -F -B -I. <laughs> but essentially, it's trying to do the same thing. How do you actually price in externalities in the accounting statement so that your balance sheet actually embeds impact adjusted values when you do your assets and liabilities, when you do your mm -hmm. P&L. Um, it's showing some promise. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that's like reforming accounting practices, mm -hmm. uh, re reforming gap, which is different. But just to even take a step back um, based on what Jim was saying, what is market rate return? Um, let's not forget that we, this whole time that impact investing has flourished in the last 14, 15 years, we have been living in a zero interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. And when cost of capital is low, many mediocre ideas got funded. I think the reckoning is going to come in this upcoming economic environment. Um, and when fund managers are going to be presented with trade-offs, when the impact is going to be... Um, running into tension with financial return. How are they going to make decisions? How, what are they going to prioritize? What are they going to sacrifice? What have they promised to their LPs? And it gets back to values, mm -hmm. right, where mm -hmm. we started, Jim. That's right. Mm -hmm. yep. I'll just add, I, I think that um, in the philanthropic um, and the grant-making side of the house, we define impact as 
inclusive informed and intentional and if we took those three eyes and we tried to apply it in the investing side i just wonder if there might be a different weighting of the of the decisions generative ai for impact anyone jim we were talking <laughs> about it a little bit um, um i'd love to see and have talked about a fund that focuses on on impact for ai uh, because i think that you know ai has the tremendous power for good or for bad and uh, i i'd love to see the focus be on good i i think we we invest in a lot of companies particularly in the disability space that are using ai in their technology in their platform and it's really a great example of how it can really be a game changer for good. Uh, and I'd love to see the emphasis on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say Fran's right in the middle of that. Yes. <laughs> Happy to talk about it. Um, you know, particularly as it relates to ESG, because ESG has become a very politicized uh, term. And, and I think the interesting thing is that, that I don't know that really most of the politicians really understand what it is to begin with. Um, and it is something that's very concerning to, uh, to us in the impact investing space. And, uh, you know, I think ESG and sustainable investing is a part of that. Um, you know, we are working on different strategies to help educate, but also lift voices from those that are respected that are you know i would say more mainstream conservatives to speak out against this so it is an effort that um, that we're looking at right now um, you know we're concerned about you know legislative attempts to take the affirmative action case mm -hmm. and try to apply it to you know impact investing or or grant making that's another area so, you know, it's a real, it is a real concern. And I think it, it's incumbent on all of us in this space to take an active role to help educate and really lift the, the, the rhetoric and not let it be co-opted for a political agenda. Would you like to? I mean, I, I can just start by saying we actually don't fund private prisons through Fidelity, so that's just want to clarify. But um, I will also add that our average donor is a 64-year-old white man. And our average um, recoverable grant participant is a 55-year-old woman. So we're starting to see changes. And I think we every week in the pandemic, I got a call from um, a, a donor who was sheltering in place with their adult children. And they were saying, we're having dinner conversations around impact investing. What should I say? What should I do? How do I start to move the needle? And I think there is a, a growing interest and demand. I, I think there are lots of opportunities to enter. But I, I just, I also think it's about how you, um, it, it's not just an age or a gender. It's also about how you define the, the impact you're seeking and whether it's justice or health or or ag or um, beyond or democracy I mean I think all of these things are places where there are a lot of entry points that are um, not just in the markets but also um, in in the community it, it's a tough question um, and are, I'm assuming you have a 401k gentleman who asked the question who's having a conversation on the side you have a 401k? Um, because I think it's different for private, uh, private 401ks and public pension funds, which to your point, the guy in the front who's looking at his phone, he, um, <laughs> um, uh, the public pension funds are under attack, especially in red states where there's state legislation potentially prohibiting pension fund fiduciaries like state treasurers from doing business with or investing in any 
impact-oriented fund, even if the ESG factors are financially material. So it, we're fighting for single materiality in this country, and um, it's a sad statement. Um, for 401ks, I mean, I, I won't opine on how moving from defined benefit to defined contribution basically completely changed the power dynamic and pushed the onus of asset allocation and planning for retirement on the employee. So there's that, which I, uh, is, is a thing. Because if, you, if, if that were the case, then you might have access to some of these private debt, private equity funds, venture capital funds, for better or for worse. Uh, but because you're in a 401k, you tend to have access to retail products. And so it's difficult to impossible to get exposure to private debt and equity where a lot of the deep impact work that these folks do um, shows up. 